Let's join together in Acts chapter 8. And we're going to move from the scene where uh, Philip and Peter and John were addressing um, uh, what we believe is a false conversion of Simon the magician. Uh, that, that guy wanted the power. That's what he was seeking. Um, even though he'd gone through the, the uh, baptism and and supposed believing, he just wanted the power and authority that you know Peter and John were wielding in the Holy Spirit, and he was rebuked. We find in, in our text, beginning in verse 25, an unnamed man by uh, the description of an Ethiopian eunuch and how he came to faith, true saving faith, uh, by hearing the gospel, and how God brought this together is amazing. So beginning there in Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel in, to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So... He got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come, in, come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of what does the prophet say this? Of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And the, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Well, what a title for our message this morning from Acts chapter 8, verses 25 through 40, as, as we look at how God um, uses Philip a deacon from the Jerusalem church uh, to go out towards the desert way uh, on the Gaza Strip as we would know it in, in modern day um, Israel. And this, this is heading towards Egypt. This is a, a widely uh, utilized road in that day from, from Egypt down to, to Jerusalem. And then on the other side of Egypt, we have what is known as Africa and the vastness of, of that continent, and that would have uh, been uh, what we know as uh, the Ethiopian Empire, and that this, this Ethiopian eunuch is, is from uh, that region, and, and how far out he's come. Some, some suggest that he's come as, as far as 1,000 to 1,200 miles to worship in Jerusalem, and to have this encounter with Philip on his return back to, to where, wherever his location is uh, in, in Ethiopia, 
Um, and it's there that we see the title from the text, uh, beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And this is a glorious text of, of a man coming to faith and salvation and how this is divinely orchestrated. Every salvation of, of a man or a woman has come as a result of divine intervention. And there are ways that God is working that sometimes that we don't see and recognize at times that you might find yourself, you know, um, in a strange place. And next thing you know, you're having a conversation. And as I've, I've seen it in my own life, I'm now having a gospel conversation with this person. And I believe that, that God has divinely uh, orchestrated those moments so that we would have an opportunity. I remember... Uh, you know, flying out of Detroit to go to Guatemala, and uh, we had to make a connection in Houston uh, to head down there. And there was this guy I met there, and we started talking, and and he was, you know, uh, heading to Guatemala himself, but he was going on business. And I just simply stated that I was uh, going with the mission team. Uh, we were going to Guatemala to to share the gospel, and we didn't have but just seconds to to speak to one another, and, and so he got on the plane, and he sat at first class, and, and then I sat on the back of the plane, and so I thought, well, at least I got to talk to the guy, and so we end up, you know, in Guatemala on uh, the, the Thursday of that week, we go to uh, a place called Lake Atitlan, and we're supposed to stay in this hotel, it was already set up, and we get there, and they had already given our rooms away. There's like 26 team members on our you know, team. And so it's, it's hard to find housing, you know, in a hotel for that number of people. So while we were speaking and sharing the gospel in schools, uh, Ezekiel Martinez, our missionary, was out and about um, trying to find us a place. And, and he found us a place. And it, it wasn't, you know, the, the really nicer place where we were going to be staying, but it was a place nonetheless and you're not going to believe this, but when we arrived, uh, I'm, I'm walking out of the vehicle and starting to head to, and it's like a kind of a two-story motel kind of situation, and I'm walking that direction, and lo and behold, there's the guy I was talking to in Houston sitting outside of that hotel. And I was like, all right, Lord, you've orchestrated this, given me this opportunity to go share the gospel with this guy, and so I walked up to him, and he was as surprised to see me as I was to see him, and I did have the opportunity to share the gospel with him, and so don't know, don't know what happened to that man in terms of his faith and where it went from there, but you know, what's, this is what we see. We, we're seeing uh, an inside picture, as it was, as it were, of, of how God is working by his spirit, by an angel, uh, by his means to to strategically connect Philip with this Ethiopian eunuch and share with him the Word of God. And it teaches us a lot about depending upon God and His divine providence. And the way that we do that is through praying. And it teaches us a lot with regards to anticipation that on any given day when you wake up in the morning, that you may sometime during that day have the opportunity to either do one of two things. One is to encourage a brother and sister in the faith, or B, to come alongside somebody and share the gospel with that person. We should be anticipating that, as we find here with Philip. And so we have a lot of, of great truth here to encourage us in how we can go about sharing the good news with other people. Now, Acts chapter 8 documents the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ beginning in Jerusalem. It starts to spread out to Judea and Samaria, as we've already noted. And, of course, Philip had been in Samaria, and there had been a great outbreak of, of the gospel and many people coming to faith there. Peter and John come uh, to authenticate, as you remember, they come to authenticate uh, the work of the Spirit. And we, we noted that in, in that moment, in terms of apostolic history, uh, we see the, the apostolic um, authentic, uh, authenticating of the arrival of the Holy Spirit, and not, not only here in Samaria, but in the house of Cornelius. And these are testified, just as it happened on the day of Pentecost. 
Um, we see it happening with the people of Samaria. We see it happening with Cornelius. And the, and the Spirit just continues to work. And the, the, the Spirit continues to work today in your life and my life at salvation. That's how we come to faith. That is John 3. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again from above. Uh, and how are you to be born again? It's through the Holy Spirit. And that's the only way you and I are going to be saved. It's going to require God making us alive together with Christ by means of his Holy Spirit. And so that's what we find. We find Philip is in Samaria, and oh, what an outbreak of the Word of God and people coming to faith. And we do not find him complaining when, when an angel of the Lord speaks to him and directs him to go uh, down to the Gaza Strip and head that way in this desert road. And he could have said, you know, there's a lot going on here. It's still happening here. You know, Peter and John, they've moved on. i got to continue this work. But he, he doesn't do that. Uh, the angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he does not hesitate. He leaves immediately. And it's there he encounters an unnamed man that we know as the Ethiopian eunuch. And he just so happens to be reading the Bible from the book of Isaiah. And so he is directed to go and share with that man because this man is reading, but he doesn't understand the text. And when he begins to engage this man, he asks him if he understands what he's reading. He said, how can I unless somebody guides me? And so beginning from this scripture, that was from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8, he preached Jesus to this man. Now, Charles Spurgeon, you know he's one of my favorite uh, old-timer preachers going back to the 1800s. He writes that having become a proselyte to the faith of Israel, because this man had traveled many miles to come and worship God in Jerusalem, this eunuch made a long and perilous journey to Jerusalem. After he had enjoyed the solemn feast, he returned, and while he traveled along, he read the Word of God. The book of the prophet of Isaiah was the portion chosen for his meditation. Does it not strike you as being remarkable that he should be reading at that moment the best text that Philip could have, have selected? In other words, from the book of Isaiah? The gospel, literally, of Jesus Christ. How many times have, have we read through that text in Isaiah 53 and I have described it's like It's like they were there, like Isaiah was standing there at the crucifixion and documenting all of these details. It's like he was seeing it with his own eyes. This is a messianic text. This is a text about Jesus. And so, Spurgeon goes on to say, he had reached the portion of Scripture from which, without the slightest digression, the evangelist preached, or the, the evangelist preached unto him Jesus as the slain lamb, the willing sacrifice for guilty men. The like combination of godly providence and the Holy Spirit constantly occurs in conversions. What the man has read in the book, the preacher is often moved by the Spirit of God to declare from the pulpit. For God has servants everywhere, and his, his secret directions are given out so that all these servants, though they are little aware of it, are led to work together for the same predestined end. How often have, uh, have the talks of young men by the wayside been reproduced by the preacher and such singular coincidences have struck their attention and been the means of impressing upon their hearts. I've actually had people, uh, after messages over the years, come up to me and say, it's like you're following me. And I say, I'm not following you. I mean, they'll say, you know, I was looking at that scripture that was not the text that I was reading from specifically, but it was an affiliated text. And it's like, I was just looking at that scripture this week. Oh, my word. And I said, I just want you to know that, that it's not I that follows you around, but it's the Holy Spirit. 
Everywhere you go, He's at work in your life and ministering in your life. And so here to this morning, we see the divine and providential hand of God in the redemption of His people. And our text this morning reveals three things. One is certainly how the Lord is working in this situation, which I call the preparation of the Lord. The Lord is divinely orchestrating. And not just these events, but we know that God's providence and His sovereignty is over, over all things. And it's hard for us to wrap our brains around that, but it's not hard for Him to wrap His infinite brains around this because He is sovereign. So we see the preparation of the Lord, and, and we just see that it's like this is, the, the, the veil has been pulled back a little bit so that we can see this happening. That there's an angel of the Lord that is involved and the Holy Spirit is working and, you know, the text and the, the whole thing, directing Philip and getting him to, to the Ethiopian eunuch. All of this is orchestrated. God is the one that, that sends the angel to tell Philip, you got to go this direction. And he didn't know exactly where he was going at the time. But when he got there, then he's directed by the Holy Spirit to go up to this chariot. That's the preparation of the Lord. And I've always said this. In many ways and forms that, you know, God, if, if you find yourself uh, with, uh, in the presence of an individual and all of a sudden you see the conversation starting to move, uh, you know, towards faith or, or questions about that kind of stuff, just know that God's hand is working in your life. Don't hesitate to share from your own experience the Word of God. And how he's changed your life. And here's a particular scripture and how God is, is working. And you, you could use Isaiah 53 as your text if you want to, to share the gospel with somebody. Don't hesitate. I want you to recognize, hey, God is working here. So the, the preparation of the Lord. Secondly, it's with the one who's going to be proclaiming. That is you and me or the preacher which is the proclamation of the Lord. In other words, I am proclaiming the Lord to this person. And I'm proclaiming the Lord by proclaiming His Word. It is necessary. We've got to share the Word of God. And so you, you find the Lord working and orchestrating the preparation of the Lord and then the, pro, the proclaimer, the proclamation of the Lord, this person like Philip is pre preaching Jesus from this scripture. And then we have the profession of the Lord. Now, you know, sometimes this does not happen after you're done proclaiming the gospel to somebody. In this particular context, it happens. We can tell that the Lord has already been working in this man's life. No one's going to travel 1,000 or 1,000 or 1,200 miles to go worship this God of the Hebrews in Israel when his own God, the king of Ethiopia, is sitting on his throne. Why would he do that? Well, it's obvious that God had been working in his life. It's obvious that, that the God of Ethiopia was not hitting much for him, and he's recognizing that this is not a true God. That somewhere in the journey of this Ethiopian eunuch, who literally, uh, you know, he was in a high royal position. It's, it's amazing that this man is traveling to Jerusalem to worship the Hebrew God. It just means that God's been working in his life. The fact that he has his own copy of the scroll of Isaiah is pretty amazing. And we see the profession of his faith. And how do we see that? Because he says, hey, here's water. What's to keep me from being baptized? So we have three things that help us in our understanding of how God is working in people coming to faith and how He uses people like us who are people of faith to accomplish this. The preparation of the Lord, the proclamation of the Lord, and the profession of the Lord. We begin with the preparation. And it's just huge what's unfolding here. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken to the word of the Lord, that is, 
Peter and John. Philip had been doing this in Samaria, but here, here comes uh, these um, apostles. They have come. They have been eyewitnesses authenticating the arrival of the Holy Spirit in Samaria so that these people know that and when he goes back to Jerusalem, that God is working in amazing ways in Samaria. And you just got to know, Samaria was, they were not good friends with the Jews, as we've talked. And, and the whole story about the good Samaritan, you know, that, that you know, um, Jewish faithful men would go by a man that's robbed and not touch him and not go near him, make their way around him. Who stopped to help you know, along the way, the Good Samaritan. And oh, wow, what? Yo, I can't believe that. But that's what the Lord is revealing. And here, you know, people are coming to Jesus Christ in Samaria. Just like he said in Acts chapter 1, that, you know, the gospel would go forth from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria. And so we think about the kind of message. And again, I just highlight this. You know, what were Peter and John preaching? What, what, what were they solemnly testifying to and speaking with regards to the word of the Lord? Well, let, let's, let's look at a couple examples from their epistles. Just real quickly. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace of that would come to you, made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he, that is, the Spirit, predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Well, what did they preach? Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in ignorance, in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's works, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing, here it is, that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That gives us some insights, like from Peter or John, when he wrote his first epistle. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. What was, and here's, this is a solemn testimony. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And who was manifested to them? Jesus. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you may ha too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. And if you want more insights into what these men, like Peter and John, were preaching as apostles, go to the book of John and see what John was solemnly testifying to. And go to the book of Mark, which we understand uh, would have been the source for what you know, Mark was documenting in terms of his particular gospel. Pretty amazing stuff. And so that's what they were doing. The apostles were solemnly testifying, and they were preaching the Word of God. They were preaching from the Old Testament Scriptures. These Gospels were not available at that time. So when, by the time we get Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, he's preaching the Gospel from Isaiah 53. Amazing. 
Now, how did Christ's disciples learn to testify and preach like this? Well, Luke tells us, as Jesus had rose from the dead and, and they began to see and come across Jesus in person, but there was these men on the Emmaus Road that didn't recognize Jesus, and, and they were just all up in arms about what was going on and what had happened in Jerusalem, and, and Jesus is walking with them, and he said, what are you talking about? Are you kidding me? You haven't seen or heard any of this stuff about Jesus and these things? And so Jesus, he responds in, in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, and he said to them, Oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And here it is. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Not only did Jesus teach them these things, but also he promised that the Holy Spirit would bring it to their minds, everything that they were supposed to teach. So that's what the apostles are doing at this time in history. And this is what we find. And so they start back to Jerusalem. And they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans on their way back. And this is where we see a whole new moment. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. An angel of God is dispatched. And he, he speaks to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And this this Gaza Strip, as it were, this road is heading towards Egypt and then beyond. And so Philip just got up and went. He didn't know exactly where he was going other than he needed to get on this road and just keep going. And it says there in verse 27 that there was an Ethiopian eunuch. And Ethiopia was in, in ancient era of this Roman Greco historic period of time. It was not just a nation in and of itself at that time like we know them now. It would have been inclusive of like all of Africa. That it, it was an empire, the empire of Ethiopia. And it, it would have gone far beyond in terms of the deserts and all of, of, uh, of Africa. And, and some suggest even further than that. It was a vast empire. And so where this guy is coming from, we, we don't have the exact location. What we do know is that he was a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. Now, Candace is actually, it is a name. It's a female name. It's used even in our day today. But in terms of Ethiopia, it would have been used as the Candace, just like what we would see in terms of Egypt, the Pharaoh. In other words, it's a royal designation. It was the dynastic name for queens of the Ethiopian, e Ethiopians. And, and Candace was the queen mother. The Candace was the queen mother of Ethiopia. And according to history, her son would have been the actual king. But he was revered as an and deified as a god by the empire. And so it was above his deification to be in the earthly matters of the trivial matters of reigning over the kingdom and, and ruling. So that deferred to the queen mother, the Candace. And so she is taking care of the administration. And a part of her administration, in terms of how she is uh, acting as the leader of uh, Ethiopia and you know, working in terms of her royal court, this Ethiopian eunuch was the treasurer. He was over the treasury of the entire empire under the reign of this queen. And so he's a very wealthy man. And he had come to Jerusalem. And this is staggering. That this man of Ethiopia, Ethiopia who have their own gods. And one of them is sitting 
on the throne that they revere and venerate as a god. And yet he's coming all the way to Jerusalem to worship the God of the Hebrews. This is a very important part of the story as it's unfolding. It describes what are the religious passions that are stirred up in his being, that he wants to come and worship this God, that he has a scroll. Who knows how many scrolls he has of the Old Testament Scriptures, but we do know that he has a copy of the book of Isaiah. Now, in our day, it's not unthought of that the majority of people throughout the world, and I say majority, there's a lot of people you know, that we used to be able to say that they wouldn't have access to the Word, but because of the things that are online with social, uh, you know, Internet-type capabilities, I mean, the Word of God is moving in, in areas, in places that we just never dreamed of. In our country, I mean, we got more than one copy, generally, you know, in, in your house. There, I mean, you had to be a wealthy person, a very wealthy person to have a, a scroll of the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures, such as this of the Isaiah. And he was returning. He had been to Jerusalem, had been there for the, the festivals and all the, the rituals, and you know, had on his way back, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And that's where we find, in terms of, you know, Philip's responsibility now, he, he's been e immediately obedient as he's dispatched. He leaves immediately from Samaria, where there's a lot still going on. Yet he heads out to the Gaza Strip, to this Gaza Road, the desert road. And he comes across this man. And here we see the proclamation of the Lord. Here's the man who is going to share the word of God. He's going to explain it. It says there in verse 29 that Philip is directed by the Spirit to go up and join this chariot. And so that's what he does. He goes up. And how, how do we know that he goes up? Well, it says he ran. <laughs> so I don't know in terms of, of certainly running is um, it's an expedited way to get to where you're going. You know, whether you're walking, but if you want to get there faster, you're going to run. Yet I don't know in terms of, you know, we, we know that there is some travel time in terms of their conversation because he goes up in uh, the chariot and later um, the, the um, Ethiopian eunuch orders his uh, uh, chariot to, to stop. So I don't know if he's running up to run alongside of it or that it stopped and he runs straight to it and begins to engage this man. He, he just re, he ran up and heard him reading from, the, from Isaiah the prophet. And Philip asked them, the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says in John chapter 16, he's talking about the role of the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And I bring this up because when the Ethiopian responds and, and to the answer to the question, do you understand what you're reading? He says, well, how, can't, how could I unless someone guides me? It's the same Greek word. And I want you to know that certainly Philip is going to be used by the Holy Spirit to preach this text that he is reading. But it is the Holy Spirit that's also at work not only in the Ethiopian's life, but in Philip's life. I just want us to see that, that 
you know, the, the divine preparation, the preparation of the Lord, is, it just continues. He's working even in Philip's life, just as he's working in your life and my life. That's why I also have said, if somebody pops in your brain while you're driving down the road, you're like, why am I thinking about so-and-so? Well, use that as an opportunity to pray for so-and-so. You might, when you get to your destination, stop and just send them a little text with some scripture and say, hey, I'm just praying for you. You came to my mind. If you need anything, let me know. I just, I want us to be anticipating that God's going to put people in front of us as we go throughout the day. We're going to walk across the paths of individuals that, that we're going to have the opportunity to come alongside of, most importantly, to share the word of God, the gospel. So the eunuch, he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Again, this is directly connected to a text that I quote all the time from Romans chapter 10. When we see in verse 13, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Come on up here, Philip. There's a preacher on the grounds. He has been dispatched. He's been strategically placed. God sent this preacher. And as we think about, you know, preaching, as, as you remember, when the church was scattered, it wasn't the apostles that were going out to Judea and Samaria. It was the church. And they were preaching. But the word for preaching in that context was evangelizing. They were sharing the gospel so I, I want you to know that it's not just the preacher at your pulpit. It's not just their responsibility to share this gospel message. It's every believer's responsibility. So I want you to think of yourself as dispatched. I want you to be thinking about that every day. I have been dispatched. Lord, today you are dispatching me into whatever territory, whatever direction I'm going to be going. Sometimes you know exactly where you're going. Sometimes you have a surprise movement in another direction. And before you know it, you're in conversations with people and you have opportunities to share the gospel. How lovely, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Now, the passage that he was reading from is from Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. And he's, he's documented in here for us. Uh, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And so, like John the Baptist would later, in a very Isaiah type of way, point to his followers when Jesus was coming towards them and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Oh, John the Baptist knew Isaiah. He was... He was a dear prophet to John the Baptist. And so we see here, he's reading from this text. And the eunuch had a question. He says, please tell me of whom does the prophet say, uh, say this? Of himself or someone else? Is he talking about himself? Or is he talking about someone else? And Philip opened his mouth. And this is the most important part of the proclamation of the Lord you know, in terms of the centerpiece of what we say to others. Again, I know oftentimes we can immediately go in to share our testimony. and We have testimonies of how we've come to faith. Praise God. But look at what Philip does. Beginning from what? This Scripture. This one, 
the very one that he's reading. He preached Jesus to him. Philip preached from the Scripture. And I want you to hear from Peter about how we should be about our daily business in preparation for sharing the Scripture and the Gospel from the very Word of God. He says in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And Philip, he was an evangelist. Philip, he knew this word. He was able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from this text. And we can preach Jesus from Old Testament Scripture every day because it's there. And that's one of the things that you'll hear from this pulpit all, often. You always, you're always hearing biblical theology. That is, we go back to Old Testament Scriptures. We're, lo we're looking back, sometimes referred to us from the very text we're in itself or making reference and say, look at this thread. This goes all the way back to the Davidic kingdom when the promise was made to David that upon his throne the Messiah would reign eternally. We try to make those connections so that when you're in conversation with people, if people have questions about salvation, even if just somebody just asks you a question, and these are great questions, how can you be saved? Take them to the Scriptures. Well, Pastor, which Scripture should I take them to? Just take one. Prepare yourself with one. Have one or two or three that you can go to. Go to this text and preach from Isaiah. Jesus. Old oh, John MacArthur notes here that Philip, oh, he truly, he is truly an evangelist. He's called Philip the evangelist. He truly, he's truly an evangelist because here is a kind of serendipitous, though divinely orchestrated encounter with this man. He is confronted with the need to completely explain to him Jesus starting at Isaiah 53. The passage he was reading, verses 32 and 33, was the great passage out of Isaiah 53, which describes the substitutionary atonement of Christ as he was led as the sacrificial lamb of God to the slaughter. Silent, humiliated, not a fair trial, his life removed from the earth. He couldn't go to a better place than Isaiah 53. Since none of the Gospels had been written yet, that really was the only place to go for the biography of Jesus. And what he means by that is it's just so clear. The details, as I've said, it's just like Isaiah was there at the time of his crucifixion and he was just writing this all down. And Philip was ready. Brothers and sisters, I want us to be ready. This is a call for us today. Be ready. Prepare yourself to share the gospel. And so the Lord, he promised. He's making promises throughout this. And it's not just Isaiah 53. We have this series of texts that are going through like Isaiah 52 and 53 and 54 and 55 and 56. And that's why I wanted to begin with Isaiah 56 this morning because it just so happens that Peter's speaking to a eunuch. And the Lord makes promises to eunuchs. Eunuchs are a part of pagan religion. A lot of eunuchs were uh, castrated. That's what it means that they became a eunuch so that they could be in charge of, of the, the, the royal harem and these kinds of things. They had responsibilities. And this one has higher responsibilities in terms of the treasury of the entire empire of Candace, the Ethiopian queen. And I, we don't have the, the reference here. It's not, it's not in our immediate text, but it is in the immediate context of the text. 
that if he has the book of Isaiah, as he goes on to read, can you imagine having been saved on that day, having been baptized, and, and Philip is swept away, taken away immediately by God, and divine, you know, um, moving from one location to another just like that, traversing space and time without walking or running or traveling, and any other means that God just put, took me from here and put me here. And here's the Ethiopian eunuch rejoicing, and I'm sure he keeps on reading, and he goes through that, and he comes to Isaiah 56, verse 4, For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and holds fast my covenant. And that's what he'd already been doing, traveling a thousand plus miles to go to Jerusalem to worship the Hebrew God. But he's not just promising, you know, you keep these things and all is going to be well. No, he makes him a greater promise. In verse 5, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. What is that name? Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. He is the rock in Daniel that is not cut or hewn by man, and he is eternal. He is the, he is the, um, the eternal son of man who's given the kingdom of David that, that will endure forever in an everlasting kingdom over and over and over and over and over again. Hebrews 1 speaks to this, the Son's throne, which is forever and ever. Verse 8, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And he's, the, the Father is saying to the Son, and he refers to him as God. The Father, but the, the Son, he, to the, of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. That's who Jesus was. There was no sin in Jesus. He was the perfect sacrifice. He was obedient to the point of death. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And your, you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. So th this is the, the fullness. I mean, you just look from one scripture to the next. And so Philip preached Jesus. He preached about the Savior. He preached the scripture. And again, this is a helpful outline for us in sharing the gospel. Go to the scriptures. What do you do when you get there? Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the Savior. So you got scripture, Savior, and then finally salvation. This is what we should be thinking about in terms of sharing the gospel. So go to the scriptures. Don't don't dance around the Scriptures. When some people say, well, I don't really like the Scriptures. I don't believe in the Scriptures. I, I'm very offended by the Scriptures. Then you're not going to win them to the Lord. Because faith comes by hearing what? And hearing by the Word of Christ, the very, the very Word of God. So don't, don't be dis, disheartened by that. If they're not interested in the Scriptures, then you have nothing more to give them. We can't save anybody by any other means but the Scriptures of God. And we're not the ones that are saving. We're, we're the ones proclaiming. Proclaim the Scriptures. Preach about the Savior. Teach, share about the Savior Jesus. And that's what we find in Acts 2, 22 through 24. G Peter is focusing on Jesus, how they crucified him, and how that was pretestined pre from the foundation of the world. And we see that in Acts 4, 12, for instance, and there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Again, we, we see it over and over again. The proclamation of Jesus. All the messages in the book of Acts are messages about Jesus. Pro proclaiming Jesus. 
And then Philip, you know, he preached the need for salvation. How do we know this? Because of a question that the Ethiopian unit asks in verse 36. As they went along the road, so you can tell they're, on, they're in the chariot and they're traveling now. So somewhere between the time he ran up to the, the, the chariot and jumped into the chariot, now they're traveling and they came to some water. And the eunuch says something pretty amazing here. He says, look, water. That's what we would say in a desert, right? <laughs> water. What prevents me from being baptized? So I want you to know that the only way that the Ethiopian eunuch could have known about that is that Philip had revealed that to him. We see in this question, is a, it is a, a, a question looking to the response, his, his response in terms of salvation. That he, he, Peter is saying this is salvation in Jesus. And what does that look like? It, it looks like what, what those people on the, on the day of Pentecost asked the apostles, brethren, what shall we do as they are being pierced to the heart? Peter said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened on that day. And so you, you must recognize that, that somewhere in this preaching Jesus, that he is also preaching salvation in Jesus. And it's going to involve repentance of, from your sin. And it's going to involve obedience to the command of Christ that we baptize every disciple in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he is eager. It's such a different set of events, isn't it? Simon the magician, give me the power. I want the power to lay my hands and dispense the Holy Spirit. And he's rebuked. This man, he wants to hear the word. I, I don't understand the word unless somebody guides me. And then he hears the word and his response to that, I should be baptized. There's water right here. And so we, we recognize then that leads to the, the profession of the Lord. And that's, that's what he does. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? What an amazing coincidence that you find water in the desert. And not just a little puddle of water, but enough where it says that they go down into the water. Now, verse 37, you we, we didn't read that in, in the text this morning because it's, it's not in the original manuscripts. It was added later. In other words, the original, earliest, there are an, uh, extant copies and then many copies that, that are, are there. And you look back and verse 37 is not there. Now, what it says that if you believe with your heart, you may, uh, certainly, you know, that is a profession of faith. If you, it's Romans chapter 10. Believe with your heart that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That, that's John 20, 30, and 31. So it's, it's not that it's wrong. It's just not there. And so the Ethiopian eunuch, he ordered the chariot to stop. Now, there, there was somebody, I think it was John MacArthur, was explaining the chariot situation, that in that day, a chariot could have meant one of two things. One is it was horse-drawn. Or the other one was human drawn. In other words, they've got these big long poles and, and then they're just carrying this person. Can you imagine doing that for 1,000 to 1,200 miles? If that were the case, even for horses to do this. So they stop. He orders, the Ethiopian eunuch orders the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch. So both of them can get into the water. And this is where you know, we get baptism, immersion baptism in these types of texts because the word baptizo means to go down into, to be immersed. And every, 
Every baptism in, in, in the New Testament scriptures is this type of baptism. They go down into the water together. And Philip baptized the eunuch. And, and it's certainly in, in, in accordance with what you know, the command of Christ would, would be. And that's how we baptize that, you know, upon your profession of faith and obedience to your to God's command, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. And so he was baptized, and it says here that Philip and the eunuch part ways. When 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 they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch no longer saw him. But he went on, and again, this is further evidence of his salvation because he went on his way, what? Rejoicing. Every believer who's a believer rejoices. We're rejoicing today as we gather in this house to sing songs of faith and to hear from God through His Word. What a rejoicing time that we have together as we continue to grow in the Lord together. And he was rejoicing. And he's probably rejoicing in that he was immediately snatched away. Only God could do something like that. But Philip found himself in Azotus, which is another, it's a, 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 a more modern term in that era for Ashdod. And Ashdod was the Philistine, one of the Philistine cities. Remember how they had captured the ark and took it? Uh, to the Philistine region, and the you know the, the 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 they put it with their false gods, and the one god they they kept falling you know fallen prostate and on its face, and then the, then the head was removed, and all these kinds of things. It's just amazing uh, moment in terms of um, you know God's providence, and you know the had, the ark of the covenant had been stolen, and and it was finally returned. So this is the Ashdod. This is Azatos. And he was preaching there the good news of the gospel. And as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Whew. The word of God. Now. In the heart of an Ethiopian eunuch going back to <laughs> His role as the treasurer. Now, there's there's a lot of, you know, stuff surrounding this man. And he was the founder founder of the Church of Ethiopia, and he he most likely was. We, we don't really we don't know we don't know this guy's name, but we do know that he came to Christ on that day, and no doubt he went back to Ethiopia in terms of whatever part of that empire, that vast empire. And the gospel would continue to prevail through his heart to other people. That's what happens, brothers and sisters. That God saves you and me. And then he dispatches us to share the hope of Christ with others. And oh, what a fitting invitation this morning. Not only for us to be encouraged as believers this morning, but for those who would hear this, that come across it on our website. We want you to know Jesus. We have preached Jesus in this place today. And He is the one who has given His life. God has sent His only begotten Son to die for our sins and pay the ransom so that we might be purchased with the blood of Christ to become the children of God, to be reconciled with God, to have our sins forgiven. And every one of us, if you're a human being, you need your sins to be forgiven. And Spurgeon, he, he notes here this morning as we conclude, the passage from which Philip's text was taken contains the most essential thing for every young man and woman to know. Let them know and understand the sixth verse of the 53rd of Isaiah. It begins with all, and it ends with all. Therefore, carry it in your memories. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
What is wanted is that we first understand that we have all gone astray. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He who does not know that he has gone astray will not care for the shepherd who comes to fetch him back again. A humbling, heartbreaking sense of our personal wandering. Wanderings from the Lord is a main force by which the Heavenly Father leads us to the Lord Jesus and His salvation. I want every young man and woman to hear, hear to know and understand the truth that salvation is the gift of divine mercy to those who are guilty and is never the reward of human merit. Christ did not come to save you because you are good, for you and I are not good, nor because you have merit, for you and I have no merit. He would not have come to save you if you had possessed merit. Why should he? There would have been no need. Oh, that you would also understand the second half of Isaiah's verse. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There is more philosophy in that statement than in all the teachings of Aristotle. There is more truth worth knowing in that one sentence than in all the books of the Alexandrian Library. The Lord Jehovah lifted up the sin of man and deliberately laid it upon his dear son. His son, willingly bearing that load as our substitute, went up to the tree, and there he bore what was due for all the weight of sin, even the penalty of darkness, desertion, and death. By bearing that chastisement, he put away sin, and he hurled it down into his own sepulcher, and that is his burial place, wherein it is buried forever. Now, every man who believes in Jesus may know that his sin was laid upon Christ and borne by Christ and put away by Christ. This is how you are to get rid of your sin. You cannot bear it, but Christ bore it. You are to accept Christ as your sin bearer, and then you may know that your sins have gone, that the depths have covered them, that there is not one of them left. Christ died that you may not die, only trust him, and you are saved. And so, Lord, we pray that today. We pray that even in this room, if there is any doubt or confusion with regards to b- belief in Christ, that, Lord, that that was cleared up today in this glorious text These words from Isaiah and these words concerning uh, what you have accomplished, Lord Jesus Christ, by your cross. How you were the lamb led to the slaughter. That your death for us as a substitute. So that you die for our sin. And if you do not die for our sin, Lord, then we will die for our sin eternally. So, Lord, open the eyes and the hearts and the minds of people who hear this message and who hear the Word of God shared by my brothers and sisters as they are dispatched divinely and providentially from this place. May may we, with great anticipation every day, be looking for opportunities to share the hope that we have in Christ, to share the Scriptures, to share Jesus, the Savior, to share the need for salvation from this one and only Savior. Make it so, Lord Jesus. Lead us, Father God. Use us to bring in the citizens of your kingdom for your glory. Make it so. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. And amen.